And that is true. Today we celebrate America. I'm sitting there thinking as I'm watching those quotes come up on the screen that uh, uh, let our national leaders say those kind of words today and they'd be voted out of office in a moment. Let those kind of statements that are not politically correct at all uh, in, the, in the nation that we're living in presently. But in 1776, 50 men signed a document. It was handwritten by Thomas Jefferson. You're familiar with it. Talked about this nation, the construction of this nation, what men are endowed with and what they can pursue. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I want to talk about that today. And I want to give you a little bit again, a little bit of history about our nation's founding. And I would say, I think with fair certainty, that most of what I will share with you today will not be found in the educational books in public schools today. It has long been written out over years as we've tried to get God out of every phase of, of, our, of our social life. But the statement that was written so clearly out in that document read like this, when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve a political bond which they have committed with one another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal nation to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitles them. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Clear words in this document, the Declaration of Independence, signed in Congress on July 4th. It's about 240 years ago, I believe, to date tomorrow of 1776. That document declared our freedom and from the oppressive rule of Great Britain and from England. And freedom was the battle cry in that day and age. And I believe again, freedom needs to be these 240 years later, our cry again. The scriptures makes it clear about a nation that honors and worships and serve God. It says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord and the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. What a great promise from scripture. The Pledge of Allegiance, which we say declares without apology that America is one nation under God. But at the same time, we have in God we trust on our coins, say a Pledge of Allegiance, one nation under God. How much has God been forgotten and how much has God been pushed to the outer circles of what's going on in the world around us? I'm always amazed to watch the political pundits of the day and the news shows of the day. In fact, when something happens in the public arena, I first I'll, I'll go to one network and see their response and then I'll go to the other network and see their response and then I'll probably crash into two or three more and just see how it's reported in so many different ways, the same event with different perspective. And it's not really a, an, an idea of reporting what's going on. Now is the idea of telling you what that has just happened and what it should mean to you, not what it does mean. But can you imagine this politically correct age? You heard this on the radio or on the TV. One of the political heads, one of the little pundits steps up and he says, here's the headline. The Chief Justice of the Supreme Court has just issued this statement. Divine providence, that, that's God. Divine providence has given to our people the choice of their rulers. And it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. Boy, that would cause enough people. What about this statement? This follows that. Inquiries by reporters reveal that almost every state legislature has now passed a law requiring all elected officials to take this oath. Here's the oath. I do profess faith in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, his only Son. I do acknowledge the Holy Scriptures of the Old and the New Testament to be given by divine inspiration. I'm sure people's heads are rolling by now. Top it off, you hear the next report coming across the news. Oh, also... Legislation was passed today in Congress to affirm that the Congress of the United States approves of and recommends the Holy Bible for use in all public schools. That's hard to imagine hearing anything like that in the nation that we live in. But do you realize that those things were declared? In fact, it was John Jay, the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, the first Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. He's also known in history as the Father of the Supreme Court was one of the primary authors of our Constitution. He wrote, it is the duty of our Christian nation to select and prefer Christians for their rulers. 
it was the national attitude, the national opinion. It was Delaware in those days, which was the first, along with others, which required office holders to make that and take that oath, affirming their belief in God and in his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and in the inspiration of scriptures. They had to affirm that. In, 19, in 1782, Congress approved, by the way, in regard to that last public announcement, it was in 18, 7, 1782 that they said that Bibles should be distributed and taught from in all our schools and that the tax dollars of the U.S. government would pay for the distribution of those Bibles to the students. In 1844, we've come a bit of the way from those days, there was a lawsuit filed against that kind of ruling by Congress in 1782. The Supreme Court made a ruling and a decision on that suit. Here's their response. Why should not the Bible and especially the New Testament, be read and taught as divine revelation in the schools? Where can the purest principles of morality be learned so clearly or so perfectly as from the New Testament? Clear statement. We've come a long way from those roots as Americans. We're constantly finding people burning flags and filing suits to remove God from public places and courtrooms and school as well as everything else. It was President Obama who made the statement that we are no longer a Christian nation. I have to pretty much agree with that statement because we are no longer. We're living in what historians call the post-Christian era in America. But if you look carefully, the truth of the matter is really a little different. We are a diverse nation. There are Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims and Jews and Baptists and Wiccans and spiritualists and Protestants and Catholics. I mean, of every order. But that's part of the banner of our constitution, freedom of religion. But the fact is, about 75% or more of this nation identifies themselves as Christians. So the majority of this nation still recognizes or at least states the fact that they believe in the Christian ideals and biblical principles. When Thomas Jefferson and our forefathers penned the words of the Declaration of Independence, they recognize certain, and I love the way it puts it in that document, certain God-given inalienable rights, life, liberty, the pursuit of happiness. I believe today Americans' understanding of what that literally means or, or, or even the rights themselves have diminished. I mean, those, the time that that was written, those words, the pursuit of life, liberty, happiness, those carried great political meaning as well as spiritual meaning. And if you understand those who pinned those words, then you'll realize the context of which they pinned them in was a spiritual format. The whole idea was freedom of religion, freedom from tyranny, freedom from England. Let's consider those three things today as we talk about life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. Each one of those men who signed the declaration for the most part believed and confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If not, they certainly believed in divine providence. They believed in a sovereign God over all things. But they understood also that only in the context of freedom of worship and a pursuit of God can true life and liberty and happiness really be found. That was that, that, that atmosphere in which those words were penned. Jesus made it clear that life ultimately comes from him. These men confess Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. That freedom to pursue Jesus was being imposed upon, that freedom to commit to Christ, that freedom to believe in Jesus Christ, there was an oppressive tyranny against those people who would pursue that. What Jesus is stating here, in very clear and plain words, that there really is no life to be found apart from God and apart from him, his son, that only true life can be experienced. I've come, Jesus said. This is his mission, that you might have life and that life more abundantly. One translation puts it this way. Jesus speaks, he said, my purpose is to give life in all of its fullness. How can you discover or pursue life without the freedom to pursue God? Because outside God, they understood there really is no life apart from Jesus Christ. I believe the founders of our nation clearly understood that and wrote about it and penned about it often. 
That unless we have a commitment to God, unless we have a, a following of Jesus Christ in our life, then there really is no purpose nor meaning for life without, with, without him. There's a lot of people are pursuing. I mean, they, they have the freedom to pursue life, but haven't discovered life. Well, you better praise God that even though you have not discovered life and the fullness or abundance of life, at least you're in a country where you can have a pursuit that seeks life. The earliest settlers though, of our nation were people who came primarily looking for that freedom to pursue Jesus Christ, to escape the tyranny of those who would keep them in bondage and have a state-sponsored religion telling them how they can operate and what they can do. If you think about it historically, most other nations outside Israel, for the most part, they came into existence purely by conquest or by selfish ambition or ambitious motives. But primarily for America, the atmosphere is God, not gold, not gain. It's out of God and a pursuit of God that the nation itself is born. Those who came over in the Mayflower in 1620, can you imagine those folks and how hardy and how stout those people were to, to flee tyranny and flee the oppression? It's while they were on the Mayflower, as they're approaching this, this country, they signed a compact, which we call the Mayflower Compact, signed beneath a swinging lantern in the cabin of the ship. And they proclaimed in that document that they'd come to the new world. And here's their motive, written clearly for historians to read today. We have come to the new world for the glory of God and for the advancement of of the Christian faith. In the early colonies, when they came and they began to establish the colonies themselves and the settlement areas, the first building that would be built and would be focused on more than residences, the first public building to be erected would be a church, a house of worship. And it's where the community would gather to worship God, to exalt Jesus, to sing unto the Lord. It's where they gathered when, in times of difficulty. It's where they gathered in times of hardship. It's where they gathered to pray. It's where they gathered to seek God's face. It's where they gathered when there was times of bountifulness and the harvest was great. It's where they gathered to, to bless the Lord and to give him gratitude for his blessings. That was 1620. 23 years later, 1643, more and more people began to arrive on the shores of this great nation and they joined together to form what is called then the New England Confederation. The New England Confederation wrote a constitution. It is the first constitution written in the new world. And it began with these words. We all come into these parts with one and the same end and one aim, namely to advance the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and to enjoy the liberties of the gospel in purity and in peace. Now, there's a great time where God's moving as the, as, the, as the country's being settled. But for the next 150 years, as you look at the history of this nation, from the time of the earliest settlers to the beginning of our nation, prior to the signing of the Declaration of Independence, there were some times we were not really proud of as Americans. In fact, there was a time of great spiritual darkness. Many people were coming to the nation, immigrants from all over the world. Many of them were not coming for God. Many of them were coming for gain and for opportunity, all right? And they came for completely different reasons and different motives than the earliest of settlers. And the end result of it all was that by 1730, this is 100 years later than the Mayflower Compact, there's only about 10% of the people in the colonies attended church at all or confessed any spiritual significance in their life. And then something amazing happened. If you study history, you'll see that about in 1734, there was a great birth of a great move of God in this country. It was called the Great Spiritual Awakening. You can read about it in history. What happened in the Great Spiritual Awakening was that a handful of preachers and people began to get together and pray, realizing the spiritual destitution of the hour and the darkness of the day in, in which they were living in, they began to seek God's faith. There were preachers who found what is called a backbone, which would be well for preachers to find today. And those preachers began to preach in the streets as well as in the pulpit. They began to preach in the fields. People began to get saved. Tens of thousands of thousands of people began to get saved. If you read the accounts, it's incredible how people are getting saved in their homes without anybody preaching them. They're falling under conviction, waking up in the midst of their sleep and crying tears of repentance and faith and I need to get my life right with God. My, my life is empty without God. And the great spiritual awakening took place. In fact, Benjamin Franklin wrote in those days, he said, it was wonderful to see the changes soon made in the manners of our inhabitants. From being thoughtless and indifferent about religion, it seemed if all the world were growing religious, 
so that no one could walk through a town in an evening without hearing psalms sung in different families on every street. God begins to move across the nation. Revival begins to take place. People are being saved on every hand. Why am I telling you this? Because this is very important, that in the midst and in the atmosphere of the great awakening and the great spiritual move of God, it, it, it becomes the precursor to the American Revolution. Our founding fathers, those who signed, the authors of the Declaration of Independence, the signers, those who wrote our Constitution and the Bill of Rights, those who put their lives on the line, those who fought and died that we might be free as a nation, they also grew up and came into leadership during the time of the Great Awakening. They came alive spiritually. And that awakening was engulfing the land, engulfed their hearts. You listen to the prayers of, of George Washington from his personal diary. I know a lot of people refer to George Washington's writing and historians will make a point out, well, this was not signed by him or this was written by a secretary, but signed by him. In his own handwriting, here's what George Washington wrote. Let my heart, gracious God, be so affected with your glory and majesty that I may discharge those weighty duties which thou requires of me. Again, I've called on thee for pardon and forgiveness of sin. For the sacrifice of Jesus Christ offered on the cross for me, thou gavest thy son to die for me and has given me assurance of my salvation. That's the kind of leadership we need in our nation today. The first president boldly, unashamedly acknowledged that Jesus Christ is the son of God. He boldly acknowledged the sovereignty of God and that God is the source of all life. He wasn't playing political correctness games. He knew and he believed that it was only through Jesus Christ that his sins and that anybody's sins could ever be forgiven. It was only through Jesus Christ that you could have eternal life. And I've come to know him. You've come to know Christ. Those who've ever trusted Jesus know what it means now to have life. Jesus said, I've come, you might have life. These writers, these authors, these patriots lived in a spiritual environment, in a spiritual atmosphere, atmosphere that when they talked about the pursuit of life, they understood that you have to be able to express yourself and your heart and your worship before God freely before you can have that kind of freedom in your life. Now, the second of our inalienable rights is according to the Declaration of Independence is liberty. Life and liberty. You know, it was Patrick Henry, who was the great patriot during the time of the infancy of our nation. If you've never spent much time studying this man's life or seeing what a bold patriot was, I mean, he was a fiery speaker. I mean, he, when he spoke, people listened. He resisted the Stamp Act with words like this. Caesar had his Brutus. Charles I had his Cromwell. George III may profit from their example. If this be treason, let's make the most of it. That stirred a war up. <laughs> that got things going. But it was his most famous speech as he stood before the Virginia Assembly in 1775. While the British our troops are advancing to basically enforce the King George's rule on Virginia. That he gave them one of his fiery speeches. In fact, it was the end of his speech when he made those statements that most of us have heard. When he cried loudly, if life's so dear, is life so dear or peace so sweet as to be purchased at the price of chains and slavery? Forbid it, almighty God. I know not what course others may take, but as for me, give me liberty or give me death. And he sparked a fire that still burns in the heart of this nation. I mean, the French in later years gave that tremendous statue, the Statue of Liberty to our nation, stands on the island of Manhattan. I can't tell you how many people I've talked to from soldiers to, to Americans who've come in through that island and come in through that port, the Sea Lady Liberty lifting up that torch of freedom, tell you how odd they are or how they are inspired by it. First time I ever saw it, I was inspired by it. To realize that we are the nation that holds a torch of freedom up. We're the nation that holds up the offer and the hope of real life. But we know from our very roots and from our very beginning that life and liberty come first and foremost through Jesus Christ. And now we've prepared in a place and a nation and home where we can exercise that pursuit with freedom. Here's what Jesus says, that he's come into this world with a mission of liberty. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. 
He sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and the recovering of sight to the blind and to set at liberty those who are oppressed and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Jesus proclaimed liberty. There were oppressions upon every one of our life. You may, you may not be aware of them. There's the oppression that Paul talked about and Jesus talked about of the law. The law was given as a standard to declare to man that God is a righteous God and is a holy God. And those commandments were pinned out clearly for us to show us how God is righteous and how God is just. When the Bible says, thou shalt not steal, God's given a declaration of his character that I'm not a thief. When God says, thou shalt not commit adultery. God's showing us that he's what he's like, that he's not an adulterer. And God says, thou shalt not lie. God's saying, I'm not a liar. Don't you lie. There is no God beside me. It's the declaration that's made clearly through the law. But the problem is, none of us in and of ourselves, by our own merit, our own strength, can uphold the law because we are by nature sinners. So God gives us this standard and shows us what righteousness is. We, at that point, learn like students from a teacher, the law, that we are incapable of keeping it. And we need a savior, we need a deliverer, we need someone to help us, to save us, to set us free. Jesus said, I've come to set at liberty those who were in captivity to the law. The Bible tells us in the book of Colossians that Jesus was nailed to the cross and all the debt that we had and all the law that was against us was nailed to his cross and he became sin for us who knew no sin. Because we can't keep the law because we're sinners. And because we're sinners, the only thing we look forward to, although there's not much to look forward to, is death. Because the wages of sin is death. Jesus says, I come and proclaim freedom from the law, from sin, from death. I offer you grace. And you can live the right kind of life when you have me in your life to give you life. The Bible says in Romans, because you belong to him, the power of life giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin and death. The Bible tells us that when we come to Christ, that his Holy Spirit comes into our life. And it says there, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's liberty. So the pursuit of life is in Christ. The pursuit of liberty is in the Lord Jesus Christ. This country, whether you want to accept the fact or not, or be like the, those who today would try to scratch this out of history books today, this country was founded by people who trusted more in the liberty found in Jesus Christ than the liberty that could be granted even by their own constitution because freedom comes in Christ. We often forget that in declaring that their independence from England, our forefathers made an equally strong declaration of their dependence upon God. Independence from England, dependence upon God. Well, I just don't know, pastor, if I believe that. Listen to the closing words of their declaration. It solemnly states, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortune, and our sacred honor. Sometimes we'll focus on what they gave, their, they pledged their lives and their fortunes and their sacred honor. But it starts out, we firmly acknowledge our dependence upon God. This is the source of where we can, where we'll find the strength to pledge our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. And it's so important, people, that we remember this very basic declaration of their dependence on God. Because the United States today is rapidly forgetting God, no longer depending upon God. The God who gave this nation a birth time, who gave this nation its greatest. The God who raised up a nation at just a time to send the gospel to the rest of the entire world. America sent more missionaries and spread more gospel than any previous existing nation has ever done. The only source of true liberty is our God. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, happiness, if you talk to people today, it kind of comes and goes. Situations, experiences, they make us happy or sad. So we kind of have our happiness depending on the happenings in our life. But these founders of the Declaration realize that true happiness is not found in situations or loss or gain to make us sad or to make us happy. But it's in Jesus Christ our happiness. If I find my happiness in Christ, then my happiness is not dependent on any other outside source. There's a word in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, that little section where he talks about blessed are these and blessed are that. Literally, please understand, 
in the truest sense of that Greek word, it is the word for happy. And it's a happiness that's not based upon circumstance. It's not a happiness based upon money. It's not a happiness based upon gain or fortune or lack of fortune. Let me read it to you from a little different translation just to give you an idea where it's translated from blessed to happy. It writes it like this. The, those people who know they have great spiritual needs are happy because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Those who are sad now are happy because God will comfort them. Those who are humble are happy because the earth will belong to them. Those who want to do right more than anything else are happy because God will fully satisfy them. Those who show mercy to others are happy because God will show mercy to them. Those who are pure in their thinking, they're happy because they'll be with God. Those who work to bring peace, they're happy because God will call them his children. Those who are treated badly for doing good sake, they're happy because the kingdom of heaven belongs to them. Those are the words of the Lord Jesus. Blessed literally means happy. And again, it's that, it's, it's that, it's that relationship between a person and their God through his son, Jesus Christ, that brings about a confidence and a dependence and, a, and an understanding that, hey, things could get bad tomorrow. I could lose my job tomorrow. I could lose my health tomorrow. I could lose my fortunes tomorrow. I, it could all change and go south. But you know what? As long as I have God, as long as I have Christ, as long as he's in my life, I'm gonna make it. Because there's something more I'm looking forward to than these temporary pursuits that this world offers. And most of the pursuit and people's look for happiness is based upon gain, not God. Gold, not Jesus. And those people who make stuff their pursuit, they're never happy. Amen. Most unhappy people I've ever known, some of the richest people I've ever known. You cannot fill those empty spaces with little bits of stuff. It just doesn't work. True happiness, according to the word of God, is only found in Jesus Christ. True happiness, even according to the founders of our country, verify this. There's an author by the name of Emory Peck. I'll show you a little a poem that shows how well he understood that joy and happiness is only found in Jesus Christ. He writes this, if the skies above you are gray and you're feeling so blue, if your cares and burdens seem great all the whole day through, there's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, friend trust in his promise grand. Sing and you'll be happy today. Press along to the goal. Trust in him who leads the way. He's keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Why? Because we're not looking at this world. We're looking at things above. But how many people do you absolutely know that are just really happy? There's not a whole lot of people just happy in life. Not a lot of people are just singing this song. Praise coming out of their heart and mouth and life. In fact, psychologists, I hate to quote them, but they tell us there's three things that people need to make them happy. Something to do, someone to love, and something to look forward to. They say, if you can have that in your life, then you, then you can discover happiness. Well, it depends, it depends what you do and who you love and what you're looking forward to. Jesus fulfills every one of those needs. Jesus gives us all, through, all three. Jesus gave us something to do. I tell you the truth, he said, whoever believes in me will do the things that I do. What's the thing that we do? We believe. And because we believe, it changes our behavior. So our behaviors change, not because we're trying to be a better person, no, but because we believe. And all the actions of our life that are good and righteous and holy, they're actions based upon the fact, I believe in him, whoever believes in me. You know what to do if you're looking for happiness today? Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Step number one, confess your sins. Give your heart, give your life to Jesus Christ. Jesus gave us someone to love. If anyone loves me, he will obey my teaching. My father will love him. We will come to him and we will make our home with him. What's the Bible saying here? Scriptures make it clear that you love God. That's the first order of man, really. Love God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength, all your body. You love God and then you love one another as you love yourself. The truest form of love is found in Jesus Christ. No greater love has ever been de demonstrated than Jesus who gives up his holy, pure life for those who are unholy and impure because he loves them. Jesus also gave us something to look forward to. All those verses I just read from John 14, it starts off with this, you know, don't be afraid, you know, I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
that where I am, you may be also. I have something to look forward to. Jesus' last words to his disciples right before the cross were these words. It's getting ready to get bad. I'm going to die. I'm going to the cross and suffer you. But don't be afraid. I'm going to go prepare a place for you so that where I am, you can be. We're going to be together. We have something to look forward to. We have, you know, death shouldn't scare you. You shouldn't be afraid to die. We all think about death at different times in different ways in different situations, especially if you know someone that dies. We're thinking about what about when I die? Listen, you better be sure that when you do die, you've done that first thing. You put your faith in Jesus Christ. And you've done that second thing. You're in love with him. Because when you see him on the other side of death, you'll see him as the one who loves you and the one you love, not as the one who you disdain and who you rejected and disobeyed. We have something to be excited about. There's a great day coming. There's a glorious day coming when the kingdom of God will fill the earth. And Jesus will sit on the throne in Jerusalem. There'll be a thousand years of peace like no man has ever seen or witnessed or even thought of. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. What did he say in this passage, in this document? We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by the creator with certain inalienable rights. But among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. We started that verse with Psalms that said, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. You know, I, I, I consider myself to be a patriot. I think we have many people in our church, I would call them great patriots. They love this nation. They want to see the best happen for this nation. It's not about political parties and divisiveness and my way and your way. It's about what we can do to make this nation great. Now, obviously, what made this nation great was God. So if we're truly patriots and if we're genuinely concerned about our nation and we earnestly seek God and want him to bless this nation, then what we need to do more than anything else is make sure that our lives and that we're living our life in harmony with the will of the God whose face we seek. We sing the song, God bless America, land that I love. Stand beside her and guide her through the night with a light from above. We just sang that. It went on to say, from the mountains to the prairies, the oceans white with foam, God bless America, my home, my sweet home. May God bless America. May we see the kind of stirring that took place during the Great Awakening once again. I think, you know, we look at the, how, how deteriorated the cultures become and how far away we are from spiritual standards and moral standards and uprightness and decency anymore. I mean, we're living in such a lawless age, are we not? We're living such a law. I was listening, to, what, 330 some odd murders in Chicago just in six months, you know? It's, a, it's, a, it's an age of lawlessness we're living in. Everywhere you turn. We think that freedom means nobody has a right to tell me what to do, I'll do whatever I want to do. When freedom is not, it's not a, an absence of restrictions or boundaries, it's not it at all. We live in such a lawless age, we forgot where we've come from and have no idea of where we're headed. But we have got to get back to the place. The thing that gives me great hope is when I do look back in history at the great awakenings, the first great awakening and that second great awakening, that you look back in those times when God moved, they were desperately dark spiritual times in the nation and in the world. But in the midst of all that darkness, in the midst of all that depression, in the midst of all that lawlessness, there were handfuls of God's people who got right with God and got serious about God. And got serious about repentance and seeking God's face for their nation. And God raised up a mighty army of people. It literally changed the course of history at those, those times. How did it start? With one, two, three, four. That's it. A few here, a few here, a few there. And now that God began to move in such a tremendous and supernatural way. As we celebrate this July 4th and we celebrate the birth of our nation, I think we need to say, Lord, I want to be part of that remnant who seeks your face, truly asking you to send revival and who truly says, Lord, let it start right here. Let it, let it begin in me. We need to experience a freedom again of life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. But we understand, Lord, anything else just leads to slavery if it's without you. It leads to bondage. I think we do what the signers of the Declaration of Independence did. We declare 
our dependence upon God our Father. And we declare our dependence upon His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we begin to pursue life and liberty and happiness as it's given to us clearly and detailed out in the Scriptures in the Word of God. So that our lives begin to reflect what the kingdom of God is really all about. And the people of God get right with God, according to Second Chronicles, if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, turn from the wicked ways, seek my face fast, and I will heal their land. God, let it start here. Let it start with Believer's Fellowship. Let it start with my family. Let it start with your family. Let's see God's face. To close this message today, I don't know where you are in relationship, first of all, even to the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if there's been a pursuit in your life of God or desire to know God. But I cannot help but believe that you're sitting here today by divine providence that we've talked about. And if there is a sovereign God who loves you and you've come to this place here today to hear a message of freedom that comes through Jesus Christ, I would encourage you to acknowledge God's presence and God's convicting voice in your heart and to yield yourself to him and to yield yourself to his word and to ask him to forgive you of your sins and commit your will and your, your life to Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It is only then that you're going to begin to discover life, liberty, and true happiness. It comes through him. I gave an invitation this morning to Magnolia Campus. There's a gentleman who came forward and said, that's the message I needed. From this day on, it's different from me. This day I'm following Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior. Praise God. That may be you today. <laughs> Had another visitor there says, you know, Pastor, I'm concerned. He says, I've been visiting churches all over. He said, this first church we've been into, and of all the churches we've been visiting recently, looking for a church home. He said, you can't even go to church today and they even mention Jesus. He said, I quit counting how many times you mentioned him. <laughs> Let's be the people of Jesus. Let's be the people who live for Jesus. Let's be the people who, 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 who promote Jesus and live for Christ. If you're a Christian here today, maybe you haven't been that person. You want God to make America great again, let him make you great. Start right there. Lord, here I am. Use me to influence the culture and the world I live in by doing a work in me. We can all sit around and spit on the opposition. But what we need to do is light of fire in our hearts that others see. It'll change their lives. Let's stand as we pray.